afternoon, uh, everybody. So I see that uh, the participants are gradually uh, signing into our webinar on the inflation. So today we have uh, a pressing topic that uh, we want to link with uh, the analysis uh, we can make uh, through our uh, external data um, service, which is a leading indicator forecasting. Um, so I'm here today with Gillian Verstraten. Gillian uh, has a PhD on, on the topic and uh, he is one of our senior data scientists leading uh, the leading indicator analysis for a number of our customers in the matter. So as an agenda, Gillian, if you could go to the next slide. Today, we will have a very brief introduction on, on the service itself. Um, but what is more important, we will make the link with the inflation that is currently persisting, try to explain what the big uh, evolvements are that we currently observe also in the supply chain uh, businesses um, and, and, and try to understand the opposite forces that are driving this inflation. Later on, we will come with a kind of an outlook uh, where this inflation is bringing us. And then we will come with a methodology that we use by uh, introducing our live analysis. So through using this leading indicator analysis with external data to see how we can help you, how we can help companies in better understanding the impact and also the future impact of inflation on their businesses. So as a first introduction to leading indicators, so which are basically external data, um, what is it? In fact, it is a methodology to better be able to assess the turning points in your business. So, and better assess in this case means a couple of months that can be three, six, nine months in certain areas or even a year. And we do that through uh, comparing and monitoring macroeconomic uh, drivers. So we are integrating the business climate into the forecasts that we will make for you. And of course, link them with the existing internal data that you have of your sales. And that will typically be sales that will be segmented according to your business units. In doing that, we will also analyze the uh, the downstream changes that is happening into your business that will be of course very specific for each industry so we do that kind of exercises and based upon that we will complement typically your own forecasts that you have through customer interactions to your commercial engine also with yeah you will use in many cases statistical uh, forecasts with its limitations, but we will complement that with our own methodology, which is basically a new data expert, but that is using external data. And so that will help you to better assess the trend instead of just extrapolating with available data from previous sales. So if we go to the next slide, uh, what uh, this is a visualization of what this leading indicator analysis is doing. So on the left hand side, you see more the traditional uh, analysis, but also with limitations. So you see the black line, which is the actual sales volume that is represented. And then you see this, of course, this um, red line, which is more, yeah, uh, typically uh, extrapolating what is happening. And eh? so, and then you see that it is very difficult to capture the, uh, the changes in uh, your sales volume because it has no information in general. The past information just with the sales data is virtually impossible to see where the, an inflection point will happening. And this is typically what we can do with leading indicators. So it's a representation here. Then you see on the left side, the green uh, visualization, which of course, to a certain extent will capture the phenomenon. On the right-hand side, you see how this happens. 
or typically we will find leading indicators. For that, we have a database of yeah, more than 10 million indicators at our disposal. So full of macroeconomic indicators that uh, typically come from all the continents. So it will be uh, databases from uh, North America, from Asia, from South America, but also from Europe, of course. And there we will match that with all types of internal data that you will have. And we will check together with your teams and with our own methodologies where we find these correlations. The leading value, you see it here represented, it's typically the difference between the dotted lines. So a leading indicator will have a certain similar pattern to the actual sales that will happen in the future. And the dotted line is then the difference. If we shift it to the right, then you will see it has a predictive value of a couple of months. We will find leading indicators that have a predictive value of one month, two months, three months, but also more ideally to nine months or even more. So if we summarize the approach, so it's first having this database. So we have this at our disposal at Solvention. We do that that synchronization almost in real time. So for about 10 million indicators with all the leading databases in the world, we can also add industry specific databases that you might have and integrate them into our master database. Following that, we do a matching process. So with uh, your own uh, sales or the phenomenon we want to uh, model to forecast. So we, build, we will build a predictive model with uh, the relevant uh, leading indicators that we have identified. And then based on that, we will make a model for you or several models for your business units. And finally, we can start to build scenarios where we will simulate the evolution of certain leading economic indicators so that even we can go further than these nine months and have a look into the future for one year or more, depending on the scenario that we will build. So now, uh, Gillian, I propose that we go to the topic of inflation that we will then link with the methodology that we have to better capture all these effects into the value change of the companies we work with. So the word is yours. Okay, thank you, Christoph. Uh, so I think everybody has a story about inflation, right? Um, mine was with my grandparents who told me that a loaf of bread costed several uh, euro cents back in the days. Uh, here you can see the effect of inflation on uh, the price of a cup of coffee over time. Uh, so we see that uh, the, um, the price in US dollars that was paid for a cup of coffee has evolved from $25 in 1970 to uh, $1.59 in uh, 2019. Uh, so it's not the uh, coffee that has changed, it's the value in US dollar. Uh, for such a coffee cup of coffee that has uh, changed. So that also means that with uh, one uh, th that for the price of one uh, cup of coffee in 2019, uh, we could have paid for six cups of coffees uh, in 1970. Yeah? So that's uh, due to the effect of inflation. Yeah? So inflation, we define that as the rate at which uh, the value of a currency is uh, falling. So it tends to indicate what the general price level uh, for goods and services is, uh, whether it's rising, whether it's decreasing. So um, it's a very broad uh, definition. So you will need a good way of, uh, of measuring inflation. So typically inflation is measured using consumer price indices, which are actually a weighted average price of a basket of goods and services um, that is weighted and evaluated. Um, so that tends to indicate how uh, the price level is evolving. But uh, the side note here is it does not typically include housing prices. And so that's a very important important uh, side note. And typically it's uh, reported with and without uh, energy and food prices because those categories tend to, tend to be the most volatile 
um, of the uh, basket of goods. We also identified three different uh, effects of inflation, or types of inflation. You have the demand pool effect, which is a result of uh, extremely high demand. We also have the cost push effect, which is due to a uh, rise of uh, input prices. And uh, finally, there is a certain amount of built-in inflation in the system. Uh, uh, central banks, they are uh, printing money. So that in an in increasing amount of money uh, volume tends to have some kind of a baseline standard uh, inflation also. So let's take a look at how uh, inflation has been uh, evolving. Eh? So if we're looking at um, how inflation has evolved since the start of the century. We see that currently uh, inflation is uh, or has been above 8% and during the summer period. Uh, that threshold of 8% has uh, been uh, uh, has been reached. Ever since the summer, however, uh, um, the CPI has started to decrease a little bit uh, in the United States. The latest reading in October is 7.8%. But you have to remember that also this comes on top of an increase of uh, already 6% uh, last year. And so that uh, tends to increase the uh, average inflation over uh, the past two years by uh, quite a lot already. If you have to go back in time, Till a period where uh, such inflation numbers were reached. We actually have to go back to the early 80s, a period called the Great Inflation, where inflation reached uh, even larger percentages and there it uh, really topped 15% uh, on an annual uh, basis. If you're looking to the contribution of uh, demand driven and supply driven uh, parts of the inflation, we actually see that eh, ever since the start of the inflation uh, wave, uh, we see that for a large part, it has been the supply side that has limited or that has pushed inflation up. At the start of 21, we can see that uh, the demand driven inflation has uh, grown in importance, it has uh, increased. And even so, uh, lately over the past couple of months, we saw the contribution of supply-driven uh, inflation reducing. And so we saw we see that supply issues, they are uh, moving uh, away out of the system and um, they are easing. If we're looking what's happening in uh, Europe, in Europe, inflation is still increasing. And so in October in the Eurozone, we have reached an uh, inflation percentage of 11.5%. So we saw that inflation actually started rising later in Europe. So maybe that's the reason why that uh, inflation also hasn't uh, peaked yet, uh, or maybe it peaked already, but we don't see it yet in the data. Uh, another reason could be the energy price impact and the energy price impact in Europe is uh, a lot, lot larger and we're paying uh, in Europe a lot more for uh, energy than what's currently being paid for example in, in the US. So this is without energy prices but of course energy prices they tend to in, in influence uh, many parts of the economy so in general they also have an indirect uh, inflationary effect on uh, prices. The next part talks about uh, what the impact is uh, for companies. So we're, today we're going to talk about four topics. First one is monetary policy uh, topics. The second one are cost increases related to various components. The third one is consumer behavior. And the final one is a margin squeeze. So first of all, uh, let's look at monetary policy. So monetary policy is uh, being uh, pushed by central banks onto the economy. Those central, man, central banks in general have a dual mandate. 
which uh, states that they need to keep the inflation at a certain target level, but also they have to maximize employment. So typically uh, of uh, the central banks of the US, which is the Federal Reserve, and of the Eurozone, which is the European Central Bank, they want to keep inflation at a 2% target. Uh, uh, this 2% target is uh, good enough or is high enough to stay away from deflation, which is in general a very bad uh, situation for your economy, but it also keeps inflation at a manageable level. It doesn't stimulate the uh, economy too much so that the economy is overheating and you get runaway inflation. So central banks, they uh, toggle the economy using uh, the tools at their disposal. So uh, those tools in general are interest rates and asset buying programs or asset selling programs, uh, which reduce or increase the amount of money that circulates in the economy. Yeah. So at the start of this, uh, these uh, webinars on inflation and, and the, the, the central banks, they still considered inflation as a temporary uh, effect on the economy. Nowadays, uh, they have significantly used their tools to uh, slow down the economy and to reduce the inflation. And so they have increased interest rates quite significantly. The Central Bank of uh, Europe, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, and they also started in uh, asset selling programs, which uh, also have a slowing effect on uh, the economy. Now let's look at how this impacts costs. Yeah. So uh, one of the uh, effects of inflation, uh, which we could clearly see even uh, at, the, at, uh, the start, at the end of last year, was that prices for commodities uh, have gone up quite a lot. Eh? So for commodity prices over the course of the year, it has uh, reached a staggering plus 23%, uh, meaning that companies, they uh, charge their clients 23% uh, more on average for commodities. And of course, and this has an effect on the manufacturing industry. So in the manufacturing industry, producer prices have also increased. They did not reach the same peaks. Eh? So we see plus 20% here as a maximum, but we see eh, that still the, that effect has been very strong uh, over the past year. Another part that is imp impacting businesses is energy costs. And so, Crude oil prices have increased significantly uh, since the start of 22. Recently, they have slowed down a little bit, but they are still a lot above the levels we saw before COVID. Eh? So this is because the supply has become more uncertain, which tends to pu push prices up. And eh? so Russia as a uh, producer of uh, oil has become more uncertain. Uh, also, the OPEC, they tend to, or they, recently there have been talks about reducing oil production, which uh, increases uh, the prices of oil. And um, ever since the start of the year, the outlook of the demand has also been very strong. However, and now we're starting to see uh, initial signs of recession. So we see that demand picture basically fading away, which has a uh, deflatory effect on energy prices. So we've not only seen that effect on crude oil prices, but we also see uh, very strong increases in natural gas prices in Europe. Here captured by the Dutch TTF uh, natural gas future. We see that uh, for uh, natural gas prices, the uh, price has increased in the COVID pandemic from six euros uh, for one contract to a staggering 340 euros in, in August. And so 
That's because of the geopolitical tensions and there was a lot of uncertainty about uh, natural gas supply in Europe. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on governments to fill their reserves, which has uh, created a very high demand. Every country basically wanted to fill their reserves to the maximum level, whereas the supply has been lower and more uncertain, so that pushes prices up. However, uh, recently we see these prices fall down uh, quite a lot again. Uh, they're still a lot above normal levels, uh, but still it's, uh, it's already a lot lower than what we've seen during the summer period. Eh? So they say that uh, it's, it's clear that here in the graph that prices are three times uh, regular levels still, but it has already decreased also factor three from the peaks in, uh, in August. This has also had an effect on energy, uh, on electricity prices. So electricity prices in Europe are determined by the most expensive production method on the spot market. In the past, this was uh, coal uh, because of the expensive emission rights. But nowadays, uh, that's gas. And because that gas price that we saw in the previous slide has exploded, uh, which has led to an enormous increase in electricity prices. At the site of transportation costs, uh, we see uh, some positive signs. Uh, also relating that to supply issues that seem to be residing. Um, shipping costs, they are typically uh, driven by uh, the demand for, for, uh, for shipping, uh, for demand for shipping. Um, as the supply is fixed, uh, it typically takes years to build ships. So price fluctuations are driven by the demands. So with that, um, uh, demand picture uh, slowing down, we see that the supply issues, they are starting to normalize and uh, that um, the shipping uh, supply issues are receding. We also see that effect in the global supply chain pressures index. Uh, we see that uh, pressures are, uh, are easing, uh, the supply chain pressures index measures that by looking at also transport prices, but also uh, delivery lead times. Next, we, uh, the, the high inflation has also led to inflation in uh, food prices, but that this is also uh, driven in part due to the war in Ukraine. And both Ukraine and uh, Russia are uh, major producers of grains, of uh, fertilizers for also, for example, uh, and uh, that supply being less and more uncertain tends to drive uh, prices up of uh, food in general. And finally, on the cost perspective, there is also a risk of ending up in a wage price spiral. And this is a loop that is uh, created that uh, inflation is actually reinforced by higher wages, which in turn are the results of, uh, of inflation. And so if inflation is high, uh, wages or, uh, or, or employer employees want their wages to be adjusted to inflation, which will increase in inflation in turn, uh, which basically creates an, uh, a spiral. We also uh, see very uh, impactful effects on consumer sentiment. So consumer sentiment has since uh, the start of the inflation period and the war of in Ukraine has uh, decreased to levels that were not seen uh, since the index was started in 1966, uh, which is a very good indicator that there is a lot of uncertainty and that households are very impacted by uh, high inflation. Another indicator where we see that effect is the personal saving rate. And so personal saving rate is the percentage of a, of a household's disposable income 
uh, that is saved instead of uh, spent on goods and services. We see that uh, during the COVID lockdowns, when there were in general less uh, situations to spend your money on, uh, where uh, the saving rate really peaked to over 30% of uh, disposable income. We see that nowadays that uh, the saving rate is at the other end of the, of the, the spectrum. Saving rate has been at its all time low now. And, uh, reaching levels of three, three and a half percent of uh, households' disposable income. We also see effects uh, due to uh, uh, the monetary, or we see effects of inflation in the uh, exchange rate between the US dollar and the euro, for example. Yeah. So uh, the decreasing value of the euro. Uh, so the US dollar has strengthened a lot uh, since uh, the start of the year. This has for a large part also forced the ECB into action to strengthen the euro by following the Federal Reserve in increasing uh, their interest rates and their uh, reduction in their asset buying programs. So this has also had an effect uh, on uh, inflation for uh, European firms. And then a final effect is uh, a margin squeeze that can um, occur. And so if, uh, especially in the situation where the bargaining power of your suppliers is high, where the bargaining power of your clients is also high, you're at a very high risk to be in margin squeeze. And so if your suppliers, they end up pushing their price increases to you, and your clients are blocking your price increases, that might eat up a lot of, uh, of your margin. Uh, next, we also see some uh, opposing forces that are at work and that are impacting inflation and could be impacting your business. We see now, uh, a very uh, large discrepancy between the goals of the central banks and the governments. So central banks with their monetary policy have uh, increased interest rates, which uh, has slowed down uh, the economy, which might uh, go or lead economies into a recession in the upcoming months. Whereas uh, governments, they actually are pushing inflation in the other direction. Governments are boosting the demand by providing uh, economic softening in the recession, in the recession uh, also by provi providing a lot of uh, energy aid, especially if it's not targeted to households that are really in need. Um, it tends to increase inflation. <clears throat> Another opposing force is the effect of retailers versus producers. And so retailers during uh, recessions, they want to gain market share. And uh, they do that by uh, wanting to, uh, they, they, they apply pricing actions to uh, attract customers. So actions that are taken is increases in the number of white label products in stores, uh, promotions to lure, uh, consumers to stores and also pushing uh, price or blocking price increases um, to their suppliers. Their suppliers, on the other hand, they want to increase prices as much as they can. They want to pass along uh, costs to their clients, to the retailers, which might, uh, which is an action to retain the margin of the producer. Uh, but uh, might uh, eat the margin of the retailer. They might also want to just push the prices upward to align their products with uh, the price level of other products. So that's then more an action to improve the margin, uh, but producers then feel that they can increase prices because the level of, of most goods have uh, increased. Uh, next, we see also some um, 
uh, or we see an impact of uh, high inventories at retailers. Uh, those high inventories, they can even lead to deflationary pressures. And so on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, inventory value of Walmart, um, which has increased significantly since 2020. Uh, this has been uh, driven by a lot of that uh, uncertainty in the receiving goods. So uh, retailers have been uh, really placing orders and uh, accepting more goods than usual. However, and now they're stuck with a large part of that inventory. Uh, and if they want to uh, get, uh, get uh, their inventories out of the door, it might lead to a deflationary pressure because they might be reducing the price for the items they don't want to keep in stock anymore. And at the right hand side, you can see the uh, retail inventories uh, for all retailers in the United States. There we see that it's not a Walmart only problem, but that seems to be the case for a lot of uh, retailers that increase. So we've saw a lot of graphs uh, already in the presentation. Yeah? Uh, some of the graphs, they were quite positive, showed that inflation has peaked, that supply issues have uh, receded. Uh, others have shown that uh, inflation is still increasing. So um, what's the outlook there uh, of uh, central banks? What has to be considered here is that and there's still geopolitical tensions uh, that are a very unpredictable factor that might uh, impact that outlook. Let's first go to England. Uh, the uh, Bank of England outlook predicts that inflation will peak at Q4 and Q1 of next year. So inflation for the next coming months will be in the UK or around 13% according to their outlook. And so it's quite a lot, a lot above their 2% target. However, then um, for 23, uh, um, the central bank sees inflation still high, but it will reduce in time. Even the winter of next year, they expect it to be over that 2% uh, target level. But then afterwards, during the course of 24, um, that um, inf inflation should normalize. Uh, for the ECB, we see a very similar um, behavior. And so if you look at the blue line, which is the September outlook of uh, the ECB, uh, the ECB also expects inflation to peak in Q4 and Q1 of next year. Um, it will reach in the Eurozone um, level of near 10%. Near 10%. And then it will also recede and uh, normalize around uh, 24. However, yeah, as you can see, that outlook in, that was made in September is, has already changed a lot from the outlook made in June. So that's just to show that the outlook is uh, highly uh, uncertain according to, um, uh, to macroeconomic events, to political tensions and so forth. Uh, especially in uh, the European continents. In the US, eh, inflation, uh, we, we see a very similar, again, effect, although at less percentages. In uh, the September outlook of the Federal Reserve, the PCE inflation is expected to reach 5.4% at the end of this year. And then it will start normalizing uh, at the end of 23, they expect 2.8%, still a lot above the 2% target. But then in 24, they uh, expect it to reach um, the uh, target of around 2% inflation. Um, What's the outlook on uh, interest rates? So interest rates are uh, one of the main tools that central banks use to, uh, to, to, to curve the inflation. 
the FED provides the dot plot, which is an outlook of where they expect the interest rates to be at the end of each year. So currently they expect the interest rates to be between four and four and a half percent at the end of this year. Even though next year inflation will, uh, according to the current outlook, uh, reduce, the central bank still will keep its interest rates high to really curb inflation and the expectation of inflation out of the system. So it expects 23 to end with an even higher interest rate than we are going to see this year. Afterwards, this, uh, these rates will start normalizing again um, and uh, be reduced to more uh, neutral levels over the uh, constructive uh, levels. This has also brought us to the topic of stagflation. So stagflation is a combination of the, words, of the words stagnation and inflation, um, which is a horror scenario basically for uh, central banks, right? Because uh, if inf inflation is high, central banks want to, re want to increase uh, their interest rates to reduce the inflation, but the increases of those interest rates, they have a uh, stagnating or a recessionary effect on economies so it basically blocks the um, the tools of central banks and taking actions to curb uh, both uh, factors so um, currently we're seeing a lot of those uh, characteristics and so we're seeing already high inflation we're seeing already low to no growth in uh, the eurozone and uh, in the U u.s economy what you're currently not seeing yet is that high in unemployment. So that's definitely a good sign uh, for the economy. So what can you do about it? Uh, so that's getting a really a better understanding of what the underlying forces are at work. And um, what, how you can do that is uh, you should start uh, mapping your value chain and monitor each of those uh, chains in the value chain and so uh, you can monitor with data that is available uh, demand evolution production evolution in your entire value chain you can monitor how inventories are evolving in your value chain you can monitor how prices are evolving uh, in your value chain and so forth so in this example, uh, we will show an, uh, the value chain of uh, the automotive. So typically you have the consumer that buys cars from dealerships. Those dealerships, they get cars from vehicle manufacturers. Those vehicle manufacturers buy parts for the cars from tier one uh, 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 distributors in the automotive who again reach or receive uh, parts from further upstream suppliers. So you can say that, for example, the demand between the consumer and the dealership can be captured by vehicle sales. That's the behavior of the consumer actually buying the car. You could say that uh, a good proxy, so proxy, we define that as the an indicator that captures a uh, behavior that is difficult to observe uh, in your uh, value chain. So you could say that the behavior of uh, the car manufacturers, a good proxy for that is the motor vehicle assemblies. Of the tier ones, um, it's uh, the industrial production of motor vehicle parts. So if you're an upstream supplier, and you have limited feeling about what the consumer is doing in the market, what the tier ones are doing in, uh, in, the, in the market, in the economy, what the tier ones are do, doing in, uh, in the, the value chain. Then looking at the behavior of these indicators can really uh, give you a lot of information. Yeah? So if you're looking at the demand evolution, we see that before COVID, most of those signals were really well in sync. COVID had a disrupting effect on uh, all of the indicators, as you can see. 
on, on all of the proxies. Uh, you can see that uh, then there was an uplift in the second half of 2020. However, eh, the demand for vehicles, the sales, which is the purple line here, has increased a lot at the start of 21. The production could not uh, follow. And uh, this has resulted in uh, the, well, the production could not follow because of the semiconductor shortage. And this has re resulted in a decrease afterwards in the vehicle sales, even though the demand was, uh, the underlying demand was very high. This um, behavior can also be seen in if you're monitoring the inventories. So we see that the green line, which is the inventories of, um, uh, of, of uh, finished uh, autos, has uh, decreased strongly in the start of 21, when the demand was a lot higher than the production of uh, vehicles. And this has quickly depleted the inventories of uh, finished vehicles. <clears throat> However, what you can see in the blue line is that there have been a lot of parts flowing into the value chain. And so this is a typical uh, bullwhip effect that is occurring, where we see a lot of those uh, parts in the value chain, but they are not currently being uh, in, uh, or they were not back in that time being put into finished cars. And this uh, behavior has also been visible in uh, the pricing levels. Uh, here we're monitoring, for example, the uh, prices of used cars, which have increased significantly. Uh, over the course of a couple of months, prices have uh, been uh, increased by 50% for, for uh, used vehicles due to uh, the limited of supply of, uh, of new vehicles. So by monitoring this, you can also gain additional insights into those effects. So we have one level. One level is monitoring the indicators. If you want to take it one next, one step further, you can include some of those indicators into a forecasting model. For example, here, uh, an example also in automotive industry, uh, where you can see that a forecast model can be built using, for example, vehicle sales as an indicator, using, for example, a consumer confidence as an indicator. So as a wrap up, eh, we've discussed inflation very thoroughly. We see some um, improving signs in many indicators. We see some deteriorating signs still in other indicators. There's still a lot of downside risks, uh, especially if you're looking at the geopolitical environment. Um, central banks, they expect inflation to remain high for the remainder of next year still. Afterwards, they will uh, ease to normal levels. But what can you do about it? You can monitor how uh, each of the change chains in your value chain are evolving by monitoring the demand, inventories, prices, and orders. And in the next step, you can also include uh, those indicators into a forecast model to make a custom-made forecast model to predict your sales based on external market uh, behavior. So that's it for today. And so uh, there's still a little bit of time left for uh, Q&A. Uh, so I give the word back to Christophe. Yeah, so Gillian, thanks a lot for this clear overview of all these forces that are impacting companies so from an inflation point of view i had two questions um so still uh, we can still receive other questions i had a, a million dollar question which is more related to the level of inflation like yeah when would you expect with your crystal ball that it would end up again in a standardized level of two percent and the other question was more related to the methodology like if you want to do this analysis that you were presenting with the, the value chain and then mapping out also the evolution and the predictive models, uh, 
what is typically a uh, throughput time to have a first uh, type of uh, yeah answer from your side. Yeah, so two questions. Uh, so let's first answer uh, the second one. Um, what you what a typical timeline would be is uh, typically depending on how fast uh, you can uh, go in uh, with the business. Um, we tend to build our forecast models and our uh, monitoring dashboards according to business insights also. So we're not only looking at statistics. Uh, so in that sense, we also need some uh, time with uh, with the business to conduct interviews, to uh, have discussions on the results of uh, the statistics and so forth. So typically what we see at clients, it uh, typical time is around two months, but it can go quicker if you want to go quicker. Um, did that answer the question? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Um, if we're looking at when inflation will end, and so um, we'll scroll back a little bit in the presentation. Um, most of the central banks, they say that in uh, near 24, the uh, inflationary period will uh, end. Um, however, and that's still in uh, forecast for two years in the future, if we're remembering last year, central banks were still telling us that inflation was transitory. So I don't have to tell you that that outlook is still highly uncertain. And uh, if you ask it to me, I think it's uh, a lot of the risks are again on the downside. Eh? So it might take longer than central banks expect to fully reduce uh, inflation back to its 2% level because of the underlying geopolitical effects. Eh? If there's, again, uh, additional uncertainties or additional issues with uh, the deliveries of energy, mainly natural gas, then that might uh, significantly push up inflation, uh, especially in Europe. Okay, thanks. I think uh, your answers also quite uh, clearly illustrate the fact that doing a proper analysis of every company specific situation is quite paramount in in these times and so we are ready to do that from a solventure point of view so first of all thank you to the audience for attending uh, this webinar you can contact uh, Gillian or myself directly if you want a further input on your specific situation and the help we could provide with our teams. Um, our uh, team will also send you the link for uh, this webinar, so with the, the recording, and we look forward to see you back in our next webinar. Have a great day. Bye-bye.